To me, teaching is a great intellectual puzzle. You know, it's just a fascinating thing to think about what, what, what sets off the light bulbs, what really gets people excited about ideas. And the reason I love it so much is because I had teachers who did that to me. Just the way that they engage people. I mean, I just, I just loved that environment, that intellectual engagement. And to, that just created this lifelong interest because quite frankly, I can't imagine a better job than being a teacher. I mean, it's just fun for me because I get to talk about really interesting things with a bunch of bright, really kind of passionate students. And once you get them going, it's almost like a fire hose. It's just, it's almost overwhelming. Hi, my name is Jeff Schneider. I am a professor of economics at Bucknell University. And I'm also the executive director of the International Confederation of Associations for for Pluralism in Economics, or ICAPE. Pluralism is an interesting topic in economics, and so there are a lot of questions about what it is. And so I think what I want to start with is talking about why pluralism is important, because that is ultimately what led to the textbooks that I wrote and to my belief in the importance of pluralism. So economics is a fractured discipline. There are many different approaches. There's the mainstream, but there are a whole bunch of different heterodox schools of thought. And everybody does things differently, and everybody brings something interesting to the table. And it's, it, it, took a, it was a long journey for me to, to realize that. But uh, when I was in graduate school, I was very frustrated. I would get a macro class that was all rational expectations macro. Nothing else, not even other mainstream versions. Uh, I would get a micro class that was all one type of micro model and nothing else. So it wasn't even broad enough to encapture all of the mainstream perspectives, much less all of the heterodox perspectives. So I found that very alienating and very, I think, intellectually bankrupt to a certain degree because it's just not fair. So some of that led me to, to think, well, what, what is an ethical approach to teaching when you have a fractured discipline like economics? And that, to me, led to the idea that we can't just teach our own perspective, the one that we find most compelling. It's, it's just not the right thing to do. We have a, an obligation to cover all of the major perspectives, even the ones that we don't agree with. So that led to the development of a perspective of pluralism in which the idea is we should share the best ideas of each group and, and in particular bring them in where their ideas are most relevant. What are, their, what are the biggest insights of each group? What do mainstream economists do particularly well? What do institutionalists do particularly well? What do feminists do particularly well? And so on. And so that was the genesis of this philosophy of pluralism that led to my book series, uh, which is Economic Principles and Problems, A Pluralist Approach. And then there's a giant book, which is a thousand pages, and then there are splits for each part. And so that's the idea behind it. That's the philosophy of pluralist economics that, that is behind that. Pedagogy is a very interesting subject. And in general, we are not taught how to teach, right? We get a PhD, we do research, we get really good at research, but we are, are not trained at all in how to teach. It's the most bizarre thing because most of our job is actually teaching, and yet we have no training provided to us in teaching. So one, one of the things that I decided that I needed to do early on in my academic career is figure out what good teaching was. And I was fortunate to benefit from some mentors who really were interested in pedagogy and the whole philosophy of how, do, how should we think about reaching students in the most effective way. And, and that really resonated with me because if you care about teaching, that's what you want. You want to achieve the largest transformation in students possible. I mean, at the end of the day, education is almost an, an emancipatory um, occupation in which you're, you're bringing people along, you're opening their eyes to new insights. And so, you know, I'm, I, I always was very passionate about trying to get the most out of my students. And so figuring out how to do that meant understanding teaching and learning and the processes involved in that. So I started studying and reading and going to teaching workshops and developing um, a set of approaches on teaching that that then led me to write papers on pedagogy and I eventually ended up founding the Teaching and Learning Center at Bucknell to educate new faculty in how to teach because of course they weren't getting it either. So, so then having this background in pedagogy the, the question becomes 
how do you write a book that takes advantage of the best practices in terms of pedagogy? Because most books are just dumps of information without thinking about the interface with students and how they get the most out of it. So the key then is understanding each topic and what the hitches are and how you reach students in each topic. And that comes down to, well, for example, thinking about modeling. When you teach students a model, they need to practice it. So you have to have sufficient examples. So most textbooks will present one model and that's it. But what students need is several different examples that explore a model. So you have to have additional material to help students understand it. And you also need to have material on the assumptions and the limitations of models so they understand how to apply it and also why there are debates in economics. What pluralism really is, you know, does depend on your definition. So uh, there is superficial pluralism. So for example, I see a lot of books and a lot of uh, professors who teach, say, mainstream economics in their perspective. And in theory, that is a version of pluralism. But it's not a sophisticated ver version of pluralism, and it's not a version of pluralism that is fair to all of the different approaches. Or, to give another example, there are some books out there that sort of adopt a big tent approach. And they basically sort of present economics as a big picture without defining perspectives. And then students come away thinking economics is something it's not, which is an agreed upon big picture, which economists do not agree on a big picture, right? So you have to be much more, I think, careful about presenting perspectives and where they agree and where they don't agree in the fairest way possible. So to me, true pluralism really does involve each perspective. Now, you can't write everything in a book. You can't cover everything, so you have to be selective. So then, then you have to have a philosophy of what's important, which also means you have to know enough about each perspective to be able to make that judgment about what each, each perspective can bring to the table in the fairest way possible. One of the assertions out there is that the textbooks actually capture economics. And I find that assertion deeply problematic because they don't. They capture a perspective usually, and they certainly don't capture the history of the discipline, and they don't capture where the ideas came from, and they don't capture actually the debates over these ideas, which are often deeply uh, controversial and, and actually would call into question what's presented in the textbook. Just as a classic example, most standard mainstream textbooks include the production function without recognizing the, the Cambridge capital controversies and the fact that in general economists agreed that the standard production function model does not accurately capture what is happening in production. So it's ironic for somebody to consider textbooks as correct in capturing the past when in fact they quite literally do not. <laughs> they are not accurate. Uh, so, so then how do, you, how do you present that material? And so to me all right, and at the principal's level, you are just opening people's eyes. So you need to present the, the great economic thinkers, but you can't obviously have them read all of the Wealth of Nations or all of Capital right away. So my goal in the principal's course is to just plant the seed to get them to go, want to go to read it. So for example, Adam Smith is traditionally thought of as a laissez-faire advocate without much more sophistication than that. But if you actually read Adam Smith, he was very suspicious of monopolists and very suspicious of um, employers, you know, getting together to suppress wages and, and raise prices and things like that. So Smith is not a simplistic pro-capitalist laissez-faire theorist. He's actually a quite sophisticated moral philosopher who had deep skepticism about businessmen and their interests and how those would play out. So what I love to do is show students the actual quotes from Smith as they apply to the modern economy and get them to think about what the perspective actually is and then how that relates to modern ideas. Because I do think studying the history of thought for students, they don't tend to like history at first until they realize how it's relevant. So the key is applying the ideas from the past to the present. To me, teaching is a great intellectual puzzle. You know, it's just a fascinating thing to think about what, what what sets off the light bulbs? What really gets people excited about ideas? And 
The reason I love it so much is because I had teachers who did that to me. You know, I, I had this incredible class when I was an undergrad taught by um, a Marxist economist and a literature professor, which was about the Industrial Revolution, uh, looking at what happened to people through the literary lens and then in economics through classic works by Engels and, and um, E.P. Thompson and things like that. So, and just the way that they engage people. I mean, I just, I just loved that environment, that intellectual engagement. And to, that just created this lifelong interest because quite frankly, I can't imagine a better job than being a teacher. I mean, it's just fun for me because I get to talk about really interesting things with a bunch of bright, really kind of passionate students. Now, they're not always passionate at first, but I think the passion's in there. You just have to draw it out a little bit because they care about what's happening to the planet, to their society, to the world. And it's just a matter of tapping into that. It's this sort of latent passion in the students. And once you get them going, it's almost like a fire hose. It's just, it's almost overwhelming. But that's the beauty of it. That's what I love about teaching is, you know, creating the environment in which you can just light a fire and, and see what happens. Part of the passion for this book is also because of my passion for pluralism in general. So when I was out of grad school, I felt the need to educate myself about all of the different perspectives because I didn't get a broad background. So I took it upon myself when I was a young scholar to go to feminist conferences and, and Marxist conferences and institutionalist conferences and social economics conferences. And boy, I was just blown away. Every one of those associations had something interesting and unique that they were bringing to the table. And so I just loved that mix. And so I've tried to recreate that in the ICAPE group, which br brings all of the pluralist groups together in sort of one big umbrella. And, and uh, to me, it's just great fun seeing the interactions between feminists and Marxists and institutionalists and social economists and post-Keynesians just all debating different issues because they all come to the table with a slightly different perspective but they all have something really valuable to say. And so to me, that's the beauty of pluralism.